Hi, I'm Karen Sandler. I am the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Raise your hand if you've heard of Conservancy. Okay, so a few people here. Uh, I'll explain more about what Software Freedom Conservancy does uh, in a little bit. I also uh, am a lawyer, which <laughs> whenever I admit, I uh, feel like hiding behind a podium lest I get rotten fruit thrown at me. Uh, but I only do legal advice now for, uh, for charities, and uh, so only um, really legal work in the public interest. So I'm pro bono counsel to the Free Software Foundation and GNOME and a couple of other organizations. I'm super into free and open source software. Um, and uh, I also am a patient. These are my Twitter uh, 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 handles, which I really have a lot of criticisms of Twitter. But, uh, but I give them to you so that I know that if you're looking at your devices, you're simply talking publicly about how awesome this talk is. Um, so I'm a patient in that I have a, a big heart. Um, and I literally have a big heart. My heart is three times the size of a normal person's heart. Um, it's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's totally fine, except that I have a very high risk of suddenly dying. It's like <laughs> two to three percent chance per year. And uh, so uh, I have a defibrillator uh, that's implanted in my body and I cannot see the source code that is implanted in my body that is sewn in and screwed into my heart. And uh, this turned me into being someone who thought that open source was cool and pretty useful um, and a collaborative way to work and great in all those ways to, um, to being someone who is really passionate about software freedom. And uh, uh, it makes me the most terrifying thing at all, a cyborg lawyer. But the whole process, uh, you know, I, I wound up launching a research campaign about free and open source software and about medical devices and their safety. And, um, and I, I learned a lot from that whole process. Um, and, uh, and what I learned really is that software is something to be passionate about. It's, uh, it's not simply something esoteric. It's not simply something that we need to get things done. It is underlying the very infrastructure of what we do um, and is tied to who we are um, as people and as societies. Um, and that caused me to go from being uh, sort of just interested in legal issues to being interested in the whole um, presence of free and open source software um, in society. And I, I went to, uh, I'm now not a lawyer for my everyday job, I'm executive director of Conservancy. So if you haven't heard of Conservancy, uh, it is a, a, a nonprofit charitable organization that, uh, that is the nonprofit home of 40 free software projects. Um, raise your hand if you are using one of our projects, like Git maybe? <laughs> All right, so everybody, everybody's using uh, one of our projects, Git, Inkscape Wine, uh, QEMU. Um, there's, uh, we've got a lot of, we also are the home of Outreachy, which is an internship program for women and uh, people of color who are underrepresented in US tech. And the idea behind that is to provide opportunities so we're a more inclusive um, community. And what, what I think is most interesting about being a foundation, um, being the nonprofit home of all of these free software projects, is that really it's about power balance. It's about providing a nonprofit home for these projects so that there's a, a community manifestation of, of who these projects are and how they interact with the world. Um, and this, this talk, uh, I have to admit that I, I entitled this talk uh, what Frank and Yas wanted me to talk about, and so I cribbed it from the, the press release of what makes free software projects so successful. Um, and, and what makes free and open source software so successful to me is about the ones that get it really right are the ones that get the power balance right, that are balancing all of the interests that are at work in a free and open source software project, all of the, the social and political, legal, and technical interests. It's all about a balance of power. Um, now, as one of our corporate funders loves to say to me every time I ask if his company will be continuing to sponsor us is, 
is uh, it's all about the money, Karen. It's all about the money. Follow the money. Where's your money coming from, right? How many people here are, uh, are paid to work on free and open source software? It's like half, right? Uh, maybe a little more. Uh, you know, sort of understanding where the money flows into a community is a really important piece of understanding um, what the interests are. But where the money comes from isn't the only test to determine um, who should have a say and why in a project. Now, money is really important, right? Investors and companies are essential. We probably wouldn't get most of our projects off the ground, and we wouldn't continue to be able to make them so successful if they weren't also used in industry, and if there weren't also companies that, um, that cared about them and invested in them. Um, I think that uh, uh, being able to see the health of a project when you see what companies are adopting it and the rate of their adoption, it is an indicator of health and it is important. And you need to design a free and open source software project and community such that, uh, such that those interests are represented and, and there is that important investment. I think the half of this room that raised their hands and said that they were working in a job where they're writing free and open source software or contributing to free and open source software um, is indicative of that. It's what uh, it's some some what part of what keeps us going. But we need to balance our long-term success versus our short-term success. And long-term success um, comes from having a neutral playing field, a neutral way for us to collaborate with each other. So um, making sure that anyone who comes into a project can have a chance to have a say and contribute is a really um, important component of that. And in the corporate perspective, it comes down to uh, often what is in a long-term community's interest is different than what a company's quarterly profit interests are. So a lot of companies will be working towards quarterly results because that's how they can seek in, um, you know, investors, that's how they can uh, raise their next round of funding. Um, and that's what public companies will be looking to show to the market. They'll be looking to show, well, in the last three quarters, we've had, you know, increased, uh, you know, or, or in, you know, productivity or increased uh, profit margins from, for, for, you know, these reasons. And that, that allows them to have increased investments that helps them with sales. Their customers want to see that from quarter to quarter, they are, um, you know, they're showing growth and they're growing um, and they're showing um, uh, a, a development of their business model. But what's in their quarterly results, uh, their quarterly interests may not be in even in that own company's long-term interests, right? And what we've seen in free and open source software over the years is that free and open source software provides the ability to look really towards long-term results. And, um, and sometimes companies might be, wouldn't be able to make the choices that a long-term focused community does because free and open source software, be, be, because they're, they're getting pressure from their investors or from their customers in short-term interests. And one of the things that conservancy that we see all the time is that, is that even in, you know, in very successful projects and in starting projects, there's a lot of pressure from the companies that have an interest to make certain decisions that may not be in the long-term interests of the project, but those companies don't necessarily have the luxury to think that way, even though it will be in their long-term interests. And so having this balance of power around companies is, you know, is, is one of the things that is what, one of the reasons why free software does so well is that we, we weight the importance of community and we, um, and we build all these different kinds of mechanisms to make sure that, um, that these interests are, um, are a bit balanced. So uh, more on background for me, I am a natural optimist. I, I like sort of wake up in the morning and I just, I, I, I don't know how I got so lucky, but I sort of wind up thinking, the world is great. People are great. I love each and every one of you. You know, <laughs> that's sort of how I, I really feel about the world. Um, but uh, 
I'm a lawyer, and as a lawyer, <laughs> we are trained pessimists, right? We have to think about all the terrible things that can happen. You have to constantly think about how things can go wrong in order to make sure that they can go right. And I find that sometimes that uh, I've got that conflicting interest. Um, but as a trained pessimist, we have to safeguard ourselves for when things invariably go wrong, because they will. And there are a number of different mechanisms that we have in place to do that. Um, one of them is foundations like conservancy. Um, there are a ton of foundations in our field. All of them will tell you that they are a neutral playing field for projects to participate, right? And, uh, and, uh, and many of them are. And I'd say actually all of them are, but they all mean different things when they say that. They all mean a different balance of interests. Um, foundations really can help, um, provided that you really think about governance and you think about um, the ways in which you want your community to develop in the future. Having a corporate home, and so when I say foundations, I mean, you know, Conservancy is one, um, Apache Software Foundation is another, the Linux Foundation is another, um, and they're all made on different models. Some of them, like Linux Foundation, are trade associations where they are a, um, organized as a group of, of companies representing their member companies' interests um, and, uh, and can look for long-term, uh, you know, they, they, the, the, the technical term is, is common business interest. So they look for the long-term health of the industrial players, right? And then others like Conservancy or uh, Apache or Software in the Public Interest or the Free Software Foundation are organizations that are um, that are, are charities in the United States and there are equivalents to those organizations um, that are based in uh, in Germany and the Netherlands that are active in the free software space too. And there are a few that are starting up right now. There's like a, a really active, there are like I think three initiatives to form fiscal sponsorship organizations in Europe. Uh, so really uh, kind of a fascinating and exciting time. But, the, um, but foundations uh, really can help, but they're only one piece of the puzzle, right? Having a, a nonprofit home is one thing that, uh, that a lot of successful free and open source software projects have because it allows them to handle all of the legal things, but also provides them a structure for governance that's outside of any one company. It allows a way for people to talk to each other and have authority, but not, um, but, uh, but not, uh, you know, uh, like sort of a little bit separate from the technical direction of the project. Um, and of course, licensing has a huge component of that. And sometimes these interests from a foundation level and the license level are not entirely um, on the same page. So um, one of the things that's cool about free and open source software is that, uh, is that by definition, with a free and open license, it means that you can take your work somewhere else. So uh, the ability to fork, if it's free and open, it can be used by anyone for, for any purpose. And uh, even if there is a CLA, uh, even if there is, uh, there are other mechanisms like a, a foundational structure built in that might be exclusionary, if at the end of the day you get to the end of the road and you're really frustrated about where the project has gone, you can always climb over this barrier <laughs> and take your software to somebody else and use it. I know that's not a huge surprise to this community to, uh, to explain that. <laughs> um, but uh, but with, with different licensing, the ability to do this is really different, right? So if you've got a uh, a copyleft license, and raise your hand if you know the difference between a copyleft license and a permissive license, or rather, raise your hand if you're not sure what the difference is. There are, okay, so actually, more people here don't know the difference between a permissive and a copyleft license than uh, have heard of conservancy. So, uh, so, uh, so I will quickly explain, because I think a lot of these talks sometimes take for granted that we know that we're all sort of on the same page. Uh, so, uh, so free and open source software is predicated on licensing. It's one of these funny things that, uh, that uh, software freedom comes from kind of a, a legal hack. And, uh, and copy left is the idea that you take copyright, but to, uh, but to, to share. 
And so, uh, and so copy left licensing, the very overly simplistic explanation of it is that copy left says you can do whatever you want with this software provided that if you make changes and distribute those changes, you do so under the same license. So there's sort of reciprocal obligations. And the uh, uh, detractors call it viral. I like to think of it as snowballing for forever free. Permissive licensing says you can do whatever you want with this software, period, including proprietorization. So with a, uh, with a permissive license, often, you have, um, you have a bit of a, sometimes you have a fracturing in the market. So you have companies want, uh, often are, are very keen on permissive licenses because that means that they can take the software and, and go off and um, create their own fork of it, their own special sauce, and only contribute back to the community what they choose to contribute back. Now, there's no, I don't mean to put any judgment on permissive versus uh, permissive licensing versus copyleft. Many of Conservancy's projects are copyleft and many of them are permissively licensed. And actually, back in the day, especially, there were a lot of really strong arguments about what is freedom. And that in order to have a, f a really free um, project, you couldn't use copyleft because copyleft, in that view, imposed restrictions. And so the copyleft people were saying, no, no, our work is forever free. And the permissive license people were saying, well, that's not really free because you can't use it for everything. So like different ideas of what, of what freedom are. But when you have permissive licensing versus copyleft licensing, uh, one of the things that's most interesting is that with copy, with, with copyleft, you have kind of a built-in even playing field, right? You have a built-in equal footing for everybody. And with permissive licensing, often companies have to build in a lot of infrastructure. So uh, Martin Fink last year at uh, LinuxCon Europe, not quite a year ago, um, gave a talk where he said that HPE, Hewlett Packard Enterprises, prefers the GPL and prefers copy left. And the reasons why he talked about that were that if you use, um, if you use a permissive license, then you suddenly get into the foundation space where you have to impose all of this infrastructure to make sure that everyone is playing fairly, that everyone, and so what happens is, is that you have often these foundations with, um, you know, with governance committees where companies buy seats on the different, you know, on, on boards and can have a, a particular say, and, and, and companies get comfortable with that because they feel like their investment is assured. As long as they have an invest, as long as they rely on the software, uh, for their business, they will be investing in it, and their fees on the advisory board, on the board, or uh, you know, on the the the, uh, the board of directors, or whatever that seat is, will pay off, and so they'll pay that anyway. But Martin's point is that it's it's simply a waste of money because it will not assure an e a, a fair playing field in the long run, and it it assures it now to some extent, but then the community becomes fractured, and you can't really guarantee what companies will give back with copy left. You have this even playing field. You have the chance always to take the current state of play of the software and 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 go beyond the roadblocks that are ahead of you. And I think that uh, that everybody does need to participate in equal footing in order for a project to be truly successful. All of the projects that have really uh, succeeded in the long run have done so either in the copy left space where there's an equal footing because of the license, or in the lax permissive space when um, by usually through social pressure. So there are some very successful um, permissively licensed projects where people are, um, are, are on even footing because they um, are even footing because the companies feel like, understand the value of community and understand that they want to uh, invest in the same way as they might in a copy left community. Um, but having all of that infrastructure around foundations is much, much easier when you have a copy left project. Um, and the stronger the copy left, the less money you need and time you need to spend on governance because you have that baked in fairness. So thinking about what makes projects successful and the balance of power, it's not simply the balance of power between um, a company and a community, although, and companies and each other, although those are very important in making sure that companies can participate fairly amongst each other and also that individuals and hobbyists can contribute as much as possible um, you know, is one of the key areas. But 
Another area that is very important is that there's a balance between a company and its employees. How many people here have ever signed an employment con contract, an employment agreement? So that's like three quarters of the audience. How many people here are students? That's like there are like four or five students, so <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily expect students to uh, to have already signed an employment agreement. So I'd say that's that's virtually everybody. How many people here negotiated their agreement before they signed it? Like, wow, a lot of people. You guys are great. <laughs> so maybe like five or five to ten people here have negotiated their employment agreements. So. Everyone should know that you absolutely can negotiate your employment agreement, uh, which is something that a lot of people simply don't know. And this is one of the um, one of the areas where um, that I find is tied to success of free and open source software projects. Um, that many times employees of companies are able to um, to have to keep their contributions. Not not everybody does this, but in a lot of the key successful communities, um, companies have been more willing to let employees um, keep their contributions. And when I mean that, uh, keep their contributions, I mean uh, you can negotiate with your company to keep the copyrights that you write as part of your job. It can be part of the negotiated process. You can also negotiate certain things about whether, you know, what projects you'll work on and what, um, what licenses they'll be published under. This is something that uh, that if more employees did, more companies would be willing to do it because they'd realize that they need they need to pay attention to that in order to uh, to recruit the best talent. But it's actually also assuring the success of free software projects down the road um, because uh, because what seems evident today to you as an employee working at a company, if you're going, and I think that there are a few people in this room. Who, uh, who know this very, very well, that, that what, what, how you feel when you take the job at the beginning of the day of a relationship with an employer may not be how you feel a year or two down the road. Working on copyleft projects or projects where you have this kind of balance of power baked in make it a little bit easier. You can always take your code somewhere else. But having this ability to, 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 to always think like, a, think, think like a pessimist, you know, you have to think about all the ways that these things can go wrong and provide the mechanisms so that the product of your work will be safe down the road. And that is how we are able to uh, interact with each other in a way that creates a truly neutral playing, uh, playing field. And so I encourage everyone, Conservancy is actually starting a new project called uh, Contract Patch where we are working on providing standard language for employment agreements uh, so, that, uh, so that developers and contributors have a, um, an opportunity to simply provide sample text when they're negotiating their, um, their employment agreement so they can say, so you could say like, while you're negotiating the contract, I really want clauses one, three, and four from this particular, you know, from this, from contract patch, and the company can say, oh, well, we never take four, but we might take one, and you can add that in terms of your salary negotiations. Um, you can ask for, the asking for, um, for, uh, for negotiate, like asking for changes in your employment agreement is just a, simply another form of compensation. So uh, if you've never thought about it before, if you're offered a job, you should always negotiate the salary. <laughs> um, I didn't know this for the longest time, um, but you, 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 usually when companies are offering you a job, they give you a, uh, they, the salary they offer to you is not generally as high as the salary they would expect because they expect you to come back and ask for more. So if you don't ask for more, you're basically just taking a little bit less money. That's not always the case, but it's usually the case that you're just taking a little bit less. And it's same with the, these contracts is that they are, they are drafted as strongly as they possibly can so that when somebody comes and asks for a change, they can give you something like lawyer. It's a standard drafting technique that uh, lawyers have, where you you always have something you can give away, so that you can have a negotiation. You make somebody leave the table feeling like they walked away with something, even if it was something you were always prepared to give. And uh, so this is sort of the the basic. So we're we're working on some um, some resources to help with this, but simply asking the questions uh, goes a long way. And so that's sort of uh, in the. Uh, the balance of power in terms of how everyone can contribute to a project. Um, and I would say that, uh, that everyone means everyone, um, which I guess is a truism stated like that, but, uh, but means that 
We also need to pay attention to the demographies of our, uh, the demographics of our communities and understand that we need to welcome everyone to be contributors to our project. So um, we have all of these invisible barriers that we don't even realize that we have. And if you look around at your communities and you see that everyone looks a lot like you, um, or everyone's coming from your same perspective, that probably means that there are some invisible barriers that you didn't realize were there. And you don't notice because you're someone who is part of the, the inside team already. You're someone who's already a part of the people who are welcome into that space. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we care so much about outreachy and programs to improve diversity in these communities, because studies show that projects that are developed by a broader range of perspectives produce better results. The projects that are created are better because if you have different kinds of people who are contributing to the project, they're more likely to notice if there's, if there's a, a, a problem or if there's something that's not as good for someone with a slightly different perspective than you. If you work with only people who are like yourselves, you're gonna create a project that people like you are gonna love, but you want your software to have much broader reach than just people like you. You want so your software to, um, to be used and uh, useful and liked by everyone. In order to do that, you have to have a wider perspective of people contributing to it. So diversity is a really important component of that and um, successful free and open source. The, the thing is I can't like say, uh, the exact recipe for a successful free and open source software project because they're all a little bit different. And I think one of the things that's strongest about free and open source software is they can all grow organically to be their strongest version of themselves and all be slightly different. But having these invisible barriers removed, the visible and invisible barriers are, are really important. Um, so I'd say, you know, let's systematically look for these barriers and remove them, both the invisible ones and the visible ones. By choosing projects with a strong copy left license, you already take care of a lot of the social problems that it takes a long time to negotiate the proper governance for projects, the ways that you can have uh, hobbyists in equal footing to, uh, to companies, and you make sure that your project is there for the long run. Um, I would say that, uh, that it's about embracing the collaborative spirit all around, one of the things that's so great about free and open source software and the reason why it produces such awesome um, results is that people are working collaboratively together, but working collaboratively also means working collaboratively on a social level as well as a, um, as a, as a technical level. Um, and having, having the ability to, um, to really make sure that, um, that anyone can become a contributor is extremely important and to make sure that power is not too centralized in any one place. Um, and this is one of the reasons why um, CLAs can be so dangerous is they make that balance of power, um, power off. So I can tell you that earlier this week I was speaking at a conference called Medicine X. It's a, uh, it's a pretty cool conference. Um, it's very, very Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's about, it's about, uh, like, it, it's about patients and doctors and, um, and people throughout the medical field working together. They have hilarious buzzwords at this conference. Um, and I hope that, uh, that even though this talk is recorded, that no one from Medicine X gets offended. <laughs> but they have a, like, they're like cooperative disruption. And I don't even remember, but everything is like, is like buzzword this and buzzword that. And they're, they're all about their, uh, their, their hashtags. Um, and, um, but, but one of the things, one of the, the, the themes that I heard at this conference is that, is that medical professionals, the medical industry as a whole, doesn't think about their data, right? I am keenly aware of this because I have my defibrillator. I'm keenly aware that I can't access the information that my defibrillator is collecting about myself, right? Every time that, uh, that my heart beats, my defibrillator is listening to it and it's keeping track of it. But I can't, I can't access that data at all. Only the medical device manufacturer has that ability, right? And I can't, if there's something wrong with my heart device, I can't really do anything about it. I'm powerless to do anything about it when, um, I was recently pregnant, and while I was pregnant, I was unnecessarily shocked twice by my defibrillator. Twice.
surprised because my heart was doing something that normal pregnant women's heart does. Heart, pregnant women often have like kind of a little bit of a palpitation or a racing heartbeat. And that happened to me. And the solution for this was not to take a look at the software, which I would have really liked to have done, but was instead to prescribe me drugs that slowed my heart rate down. Seriously. So I took drugs to, to slow my heart rate down for the sole purpose of not getting shocked. I could not walk up a flight of stairs easily because I was so tired from my heart being slowed down so much. And it was, it was just this crazy thing. And my, my cardiologist was like, well, you don't want to get shocked, do you? When he kept trying to get me to take, to suggest me to take, we're like, no, I don't. But this doesn't, this is definitely not. And now the medical device companies don't want pregnant women to be shocked. I promise you, like, it's their nightmare scenario. They would work hard to make sure pregnant women aren't, aren't shocked. But I'm not the, the use case that they generally um, are, are, are working for. Younger women who become pregnant tend not to have defibrillators. So it's not a big problem, and it's a fleeting problem, right? Like if I, my heart rate was slowed down, I made it through my pregnancy, and now I'm not pregnant anymore, and I still have my defibrillator, that use case doesn't apply to me anymore. It's short-lived, right? But, uh, but the thing that came out from the point of this, this conference is that these me the medical device space is merely a metaphor for how we're building our society generally, right? My defibrillator is like somebody else's phone. You know, I, I say somebody else's, I would say mine, but I, I'm running, I'm, I'm running replicant on my, <laughs> my, old, uh, my old phone and, uh, um, and I don't use a lot of the services that a lot of other people do um, because I don't, I don't trust what's gonna happen with that data and I can't trust the safety of the phone that I can't see the software to. So these things are merely a metaphor to how we're building our society now. As we have our devices that track us everywhere we go, and as we rely on cloud services for our most critical functionality in our data, you know, these issues become incredibly important. And what seems obvious in the case of an implanted medical device, meaning, boy, if that device is sewn into her body and screwed into her heart, she really should have some confidence about the technology behind it. It's true of all of our devices and all of our data because we don't know how our data is going to be used and we don't know how our software is going to be used down the road. And so what NextCloud is doing is extremely important because what we don't have right now or what, we've, what we haven't had in the past are really good alternatives to the systems that are out there. We have you know, we have, our data has never been more fragile and our technology has never been more fragile and we have never been more in control by single companies. And um, so you all here play such a critical role in the balance of power and I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. We've got plenty of time for questions, I think. Is that true? Good. Um, so thank you. <laughs> That's just my, everyone's reading my, uh, my Creative Commons uh, CC by SA license. Uh, so you can take this talk and, and give it somewhere else, please. <laughs> um, and also Conservancy is a charity and uh, we rely on our supporters. So uh, if you have the budget, please, please become a supporter. So ask me, who has questions? You can ask me anything about, you can ask me about licensing, you can ask me about diversity work. Thanks for a great talk, Karen. Um, you explained the viral nature or the snowball effect of the uh, of the GPL, li the GPL licenses. Um, I was wondering if you could also, instead of using this um, nature in code, could use it in data. Um, I use my own um, email hosting, but I communicate a lot with people who have hosted solutions like Gmail. Could I maybe put some sort of legal lease in the footer of my emails to limit the harvesting that can be done on, on my data? So, uh I am a lawyer, yeah, exactly. but I am not your lawyer. <laughs> This is not legal advice. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, you have to be really careful with data. 
So uh, Creative Commons did this big initiative when they started doing um, uh, CC0, like the, um, it's sort of, they call it the public domain license. Um, and a lot of, uh, of uh, data organizations have been exploring these licensing possibilities. And some things that you think would be a very good idea to protect yourself down the road, like uh, uh, are, are, are things that make, will make it impossible to effectively use data. So uh, the best analogy to it in the free software space is, uh, is to put a restriction, it's akin to putting a restriction like, uh, a restriction like my, this software cannot be used for military use. If you put that in your software then, or in your license, then your, your software suddenly becomes non-free. Right, you could put restrictions that seem like they're a really good idea for all kinds of reasons, but if you restrict how the software can be used, then you're basically restricting the software in unexpected ways, and it becomes non-free. And with data, putting licenses around data, so I'm sort of talking more generally than in your specific case right now, um, putting restrictions around data means that sometimes that data becomes almost impossible to use. So a lot of the early data licenses require sort of attribution or other kinds of notification to go along with them. And you need to have notifications to travel along with your data if you're trying to restrict its use in some way, right? And if you're compiling data from enough sources that that data is useful, then you have to maintain all of those license notices and it becomes a complete legal nightmare. So you have to be really careful with how you license the data because otherwise you might basically undermine the very usefulness for which you sought it to make. Now, I also try not to host my, um, I don't host my email in a, uh, in a commercial cloud environment. I'm actually in like a, a, my email with a group of friends. I recommend people do email co-ops where you get together with a few really, like of your really closest, most trusted people, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then you split, your, your, uh, you split the time in maintaining the mail server so that no one has to do it. Anyway, that's sort of besides the point. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I think that your email that you send is protected in a number of ways. So, uh, and what you're not really looking for is a way to put something in your footer of your email that restricts it, but what you're looking for is a way to monitor terms of service. Um, so, like, how many people read terms of service before they click I agree? Probably everybody reads some of it. Like, actually, oh, wow, only like four or five people said they even read the terms of service. That's amazing. I thought most people, like, skim it. So, you didn't raise your <laughs> You've asked this question, it's so, so interesting to me because people get so like upset about, the, about some of these things and think about doing things like putting footers in their emails, but they're not reading the terms of service. Now, I don't blame you for not reading them because you can't, as it turns out. There's like a, a whole, um, there was a study done recently where uh, somebody uh, did, like took the, like, the average computer, the internet, average internet user, and took a look at like Facebook and Twitter and all of the, if you read everything, all the terms of service, because I, I try to read them all, and when you read them, you see that they then say, uh, these terms of service incorporate by reference this statement and that statement and this statement and suddenly you've got like 40 pages that you have to read before you can even get started and if you use a bank online, if you do, basically if you do anything at all, you have terms of service and you can't, so I think that this is, it's, it's just a crazy world that we have all adopted and in the US at least, I can't speak elsewhere because I'm just a, a lawyer in the US, uh, but in the US these agreements are completely enforceable, which if you had told me that when I was in law school, I would have said, no way, like there's no way that judges would find those things enforceable because like no one can read them all and ordinary people are, are agreeing to it, it's all fine print, it doesn't make any sense, but, uh, but, what we need to do is, as a society, is we need to focus on these terms of service. We need to figure out ways to simplify them and make everybody understand them, and also demand that our data is protected. And trying to create new licenses or, uh, or, or add restrictive language in an email footer is, to me, not really the right way to handle it, because it only takes care of a very small piece of the problem while inadvertently creating others. That was a little bit long-winded. 
Who else has a question? Come on, anything at all? Yeah. I don't mean to guilt people in asking questions, just there's so much that I know you, you have to, that you're such an interesting community. Is there any uh, movement of the medical industry uh, to go to open source or to open their construction, uh, not even software probably, but uh, I mean, uh, hardware is more or less open a little bit, but software is uh, very proprietary, I know. So, so I worked in uh, medical research. I worked at, here in Berlin, by the way, at the JPT, some time, and also uh, at the uh, German Cancer Research Institute. And uh, the, the data was super uh, proprietary, mm -hmm. and also the, uh, the, the software. Uh, it was uh, public financed, but uh, uh, no one released it because of time constraints. But the industry ad adopted the data, um, and uh, sometimes the software. So it's, it's crazy to me in that. US, is there any, uh, yeah, it's crazy to me that publicly funded software could not be released publicly. Yeah. It's really kind of insane to me. But in terms of movement in the, uh, is there any movement in the medical industry um, in the United States or elsewhere? I think uh, I think there, we're starting to see a little bit. Um, the short answer is no, absolutely not. The big manufacturers are are not moving on it, and I think that one of the reasons why the large medical device manufacturers are not moving is kind of counterintuitive. I think that it's actually the reason why they're not moving is mostly because they're afraid of the patent risk, that if they publish their software, um, they'll be subject to patent trolls who will basically scour the code for things that look like their patent could read on it, and then they would be subject to all these frivolous lawsuits. Uh, that's the most sensible explanation for, um, for the attitude of the medical device um, industry, because medical devices are like the perfect example of something that works with free and open source software, right? Like, I'm not gonna just buy my defibrillator from any new player in the market, right? I want a company that's been manufacturing my defibrillator for a long time. Right? I want someone who has good support for doctors. Right? I want someone who's a precision manufacturer. I want quality, like quality goods. Right? It's all these things that work with free and open source software. All of the successful business models we've seen in the past that focused around support, around um, hardware, are things that are totally true of the, the medical device space. Um, but, uh, but what I am starting to see is that now lawyers in the field um, are starting to understand and internalize the fact that security professionals have all agreed that free and open source software is better over time um, and performs better under security checks when, you know, obviously free and open source software can also be terrible, but, <laughs> but as a development methodology and, um, and the, the code bases that are actually in use and invested um, and have the same kind of support that proprietary software does, free and open source software does better over time, um, does a lot better security wise. And I think that, um, that as I started making the case more to medical device um, lawyers and, um, and executives, that in fact, the, what are they going to say? in court when somebody says, you knew that free software, you knew that open source software was safer and yet you continue to develop your software in a proprietary way. And so they're starting to kind of um, realize that the, that the fact that the security professionals have had this uh, strong conclusion might also indicate that their liability might be in fact lessened if they, um, if they entertain a free and open perspective um, or approach. While at the same time, a lot of patients have taken matters into their own hands, there's a, um, a movement called We're Not Waiting, um, which is uh, people who have diabetes. Who uh, and if you're uh, if you have uh, type one diabetes, meaning you're um, a young person who has it genetically, as opposed to it's uh, uh, type two, which is a lifestyle. If you have uh, if you're a kid, especially, and you have diabetes, having precise insulin control makes a big difference in your outlook of of life overall. Making sure that you don't have too much or too little insulin means that you have a lot less damage over time, and this is why implanted insulin pumps are so good. However, if you can't control it for your exercise level and your particular experience, then that delivery, that insulin delivery becomes clumsy. It's sort of like how my unexpected situation of being pregnant with my defibrillator becomes almost your every day. And a lot of these people are quite technical and parents of kids with diabetes have seen how if they had more control over the insulin pump, they'd be able to 
help their children live longer and healthier lives. And so the We're Not Waiting movement and the Night Scout project have basically caused, uh, they've basically reverse engineered the insulin pumps so that they can do more precise delivery. Because all this time trying to advocate and lobby the medical devices companies to change has been slow going and hasn't yielded much result. But because they've been having success, and there's like a, 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 you know, with artificial pancreas, it's like, it's really cool. Um, because they've had some, some success, companies now cannot ignore it. And they see that people are, are using these free and open source software projects to improve their own medical care. So I think we're on the verge of seeing a lot of change, but we haven't quite yet. Thank you. Yeah, um, could you maybe uh, expand on how uh, the use of CLAs is endangering uh, yeah, the balance of, uh, of power, especially uh, due to like recent events and uh, yeah, relevant uh, developments? Yeah, so I mean with CLAs, with, so I, 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 you know, I, CLAs are all a little bit different. This is like, uh, it really depends what a CLA says. So some CLAs are different than others, and some CLAs are um, are by individual. Uh, you're assigning to uh, grant. You're, you're granting rights to an individual company, and some CLAs, like the one that the Apache Software Foundation has, you're assigning rights to a foundation, and it's a little bit different depending on um, on who's a who is. Uh, receiving that grant of rights and what they promise that they're going to do or not going to do. So there's copyright license agreements and then there's copyright assignment agreements. Copyright assignment agreements, you assign your copyrights to another entity and some companies ask for this, some merely ask for a license of rights. Now in effect, those two things can really be the same because if you license to a company the right to sub-license your work, then it's effectively like an assignment agreement. They have, the company has all the rights. And what happens is that there's a, then a complete imbalance of power because what anybody can do who downloads the, the, source, the source code, um, what, what anyone can do is different than what that company can do. And you're always, um, you're always at risk that the company that you have assigned your code to will license your code and this is the most extreme circumstance, but we'll license it under a proprietary software license and that future versions of your software that you wrote, that you contributed to, will be done under a proprietary software license as well. And then you won't be able to build on it. It takes away all of the, fair, the fairness that comes with free and open source software. Um, now, as long as the company is publishing the software as they go under a free license, to some extent, at any point in time, you can continue. You can use the so, you can you can use the the software and build on it, but it creates an inherent inequity. And so, um, uh, Richard Fontana, I believe it, it was Richard, coined the phrase "inbound equals outbound," and basically saying that what license you give to others should be the license that there you know like there there should be an an equity. And so, making sure that everyone's able to play on the same field means that uh, that eliminating. CLAs is, or, or, or severely limiting them is very important because otherwise there's a limitation on who can do what in the community. Thanks. Well, I'll be here all day. Um, did, oh, did you have a question also? No? no. Okay. <laughs> I'll be here all day. If you have any more questions, and I think we're getting to the end of the time anyway, um, if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to, to come talk to me. Thank you so much for everything you do.